so we've just left your dad's house. We have. And uh, we are on our way to Scarborough. Yeah. So would this be a road that you'd travel back in the day with Little Angels to rehearse? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this, this is the main drag um, from uh, Scarborough to Pickering. It's sort of quite a famous road. Um, it was a coaching road originally. But the, yeah, the guys, Mark Plunkett lived in Hummonby, which is at the far end of this road, if you like, for want of a better description. And so they would pick, Mark would set off, come into Scarborough, pick up Bruce and Jim in the van, in the green van, and travel down this road, pick me up, and then we'd go off um, down towards Rillington, which is where we used to rehearse, which is on the road, it's like a cut through road to get to the A64, essentially. So yeah, all of this route around here, all of this countryside, it was always, this is where we, this is where we grew up, you know. Um, so yeah, it's always very, oh, whenever I drive down here, I always, it's always so reminiscent of being a young kid, really, and especially when I was first started driving and borrowing my dad's Land Rover. And <laughs> I mean, that must, that must be interesting. Were, were you doing the band stuff before you could drive? Um, around about the same time I was learning to, I mean, I learned to drive and passed my test whilst we lived in Hummonby, so I was driving, but I didn't own a car, you know yeah. what I mean? I was like, I used to borrow dad's Land Rover, which is this huge, great big long wheelbase uh, vehicle, and he never used to moan once. I mean, you know, we used to take the, I used to, I'm taking the Land Rover and I just pile it up with all the band's gear and off we went to a gig, you know, often using that Land Rover um, before we got our van. Um, so yeah, it was a bit like we had a, we had a Mini Moke for a while, which is a really old a sort of 1960s post-war run-around little vehicle, which my dad had. He wanted he always wanted to own one, and so the moment he owned it, we used to drive it and take it everywhere. <laughs> I don't think he drove it very often, but um, yeah, but I've got a lot, a lot of great memories of you know lovely wide open space. space. Yeah, it's a lovely area. I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, I often sort of said about what it, you know the sort of the reasons why we were able to achieve what we did. And I think I put a lot of it down to the fact that we were we lived in an area like this. We weren't in a city, you know, um, where there's a lot of pressures from probably a lot of bands, a lot of artists all vying for the same position, you know. I mean, Scarborough was a very vibrant music town, uh, no doubt about it. We were right smack bang in the middle of a really productive period of Scarborough's musical uh, history. But it's still small, you know. Um, and there wasn't an awful lot of, you know, an awful lot of competition in lots of ways. And so I think we, we, we rose through the ranks because we, A, we had the venues to play and there were people in the town that really wanted yeah. us to play and they, they supported the venues. It's one guy specifically, um, Paul Todd, that I've talked about a lot, you know, who was the uh, the guy who put all of the Scarborough, um, the Stephen Joseph Theatre in the Round gigs together at the Square Cat, which is where it all kicked off, really. That's where it really started for us. He sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago, sadly, but um, but yeah, so it's, you know, it, it, but I do think the environment, because we were, everywhere we went, we had to come back here. We gravitated back to Scarborough, this small, almost like cut off little east, you know, northeastern coastal town. I don't see that as a negative. It certainly wasn't a negative to us. You know, we were able to always find support and help here. Um, and we weren't, like I say, embroiled in this mass, sort of, you know, inner city, kind of like scrap for gigs or bands, you know. So at what point did you decide that you needed to break beyond the borders of North Yorkshire and venture to London? What was, was there a moment you were like, we, we need to be widened in the net and we do need to get amongst the bustle and hustle? Yeah, because, because you know, we were buying Kerrang. We were listening to Tommy, Tommy Vance on The Rock Show. All of that was international, fell far away from us. We knew it was London, you know. Um, and I think that we quickly understood that if we wanted to get beyond just being a local band, we had to go out and play elsewhere. Um, and But it was quite progressive. You know, we, we didn't do it, I don't remember it being this I don't remember it being this like it, like right. We have to go and play other places. We started getting offered stuff, and you know we would play in Leeds. We you know we'd do a gig in York. You know we'd do a gig in Brid, and then someone had. I remember there was a guy that came to one of the Stephen Joseph Theatre gigs. Um, I forget his name now, but it was a lo it was an agent from Leeds, and he'd come over with a band that were playing at the Stephen Joseph that weekend, and it, and he said to us. Well, I'd love to book you guys, you're great, you know, something we were opening for them. 
so the next minute we were getting off of gigs in Beckett's Park College in Leeds, um, Newcastle, Middlesbrough. We played all over the place, you know, and, and, and that, it just sort of happened naturally, you know. But it still felt like quite regional. And I remember the first time we ever went down to Leeds to play a gig, we thought it was like, oh my God, it's like this metropolis, you know, even though it's only sort of 60 miles, 60 miles down the road. Um, but, it, you know, it, and as we got used to doing that and found it actually really interesting and a challenge and and it f all of a sudden it felt like we were taking part you know in the, in the countrywide music industry um, and then of course you know things really changed when Power Station Records who were based in York wanted to get involved and the people that, that ran that business started to, to take an interest and that led on to us getting gigs in London I mean we had done a couple of things we played Ding Walls which was a disaster actually um, and then we ventured I mean, I think one of the key things I always talk about is that we, me and Bruce went down on a National Rapid coach and walked around the streets of London with a, with a list of gigs that we'd got out the back of the NME, you know, venues. And we just went and found these gigs and walked in and said, can we have a gig? You know, we just some brass neck, you know, we had no, no idea what we were doing. Really naive, but kind of like positive naivety, you know what I mean? You just sort of, you'll do anything. And um, we ended up with about 12 gigs, various little pubs and clubs around London, including uh, the Bull and Gate in Camden Town. Um, I think it was in Camden, and uh, and various other places. Le Beat Root, which was in the centre of London, we, we played like a on a multi-band bill where you had to pay to play. You know, you had to give them fifty quid to for the right to play. You know, it was all that sort of stuff. But it was massive learning curves, and I, I never remember us feeling worried about that. You know, we just set off to London in my dad's Land Rover again, full of all the gear. You know, parked up in St John's Wood, rocked up in St John's Wood. You know, then we got arrested by the police because we turned up in this very affluent area of the city, and they thought we were, you know, dodgy. And but you know, we, we just did it completely naively, and um, came back from that gig and had an, a, an even bigger audience here because we were like returning heroes. And so this sort of thing just sort of was progressive. You know, it happened gently over a long period of time. Um, I mean, that's that's the important point you raised there. It took a long time. Yeah. Whereas for me as a fan and anyone watching this, you know, likelihood the, the first thing was that you were suddenly out the gates with Radical Your Lover or yeah. whatever the first song people heard, Kicking Up Dust being a prime example. Yeah. And the reality was there was four or five, at least four or five years prior to that of hard, hard work. Well, yeah, I mean, well, actually probably more like three, yeah. to be fair. Um, you know, we started, we put the band together as Mr. Thrud around about sort of 84, 85, end of 84, beginning of 85, because we, I got to Sixth Form College in 84. <clears throat> That's when we, I met Bruce and um, ultimately met Jim. Can you, can you sorry to sort of sidetrack you, but this is important. Can you remember the first time you met Bruce and Jim and what, what connect, what drew you together? What connected you? Well, it was Mark Plunkett, because Mark, um, because, you know, I, I'd gone to secondary school with Mark and we'd known each other since we were sort of literally eight years old. And um, But I knew that Mark played in what was called the Easy Band, which was a, an inter-school um, sort of big band. So it was like brass instruments, strings, but they had a drummer and a bass player and a guitar player. Uh, and I know that Bruce's had been, name had been mentioned because they were doing, they used to do loads of competitions. They went, they went down and played at the Royal Albert Hall, while rather ironically, um, as part of this big competition. And um, it was a real big noise around the time. Like it was very, it was, always, it was always in the local paper that the Easy Band were doing really well and the school competitions and all this sort of stuff. And so when we got to sick form, I already knew that Bruce existed, but I'd never met him. Um, but I know that he played guitar in Easy Band as well as saxophone actually. He started out playing saxophone, Bruce did. Um, and so I remember going there like the first day, meeting up with Mark, and I think we met on that first day of Sixth Form College, and within a week or so, we had done, there was this whole suggestion that we were gonna play, a, we were gonna play together, because, you know, by this point, Zeus, which is the band that me and Mark Plunkett had, we had a drummer, you know, we had a, a guitar player who wasn't at Sixth Form, but he was lived in Humminby. Um, we were all we were all playing. We were all sort of doing stuff, you know. So I remember meeting Bruce, and so there was this. this it was all of a sudden suggested that we were going to work. We were going to um, do this gig at Sixth Form College in the, in in a porter cabin. There was like a porter cabin. I guess it would have been one of the classrooms, and 
we asked if we could rehearse him there and of course this was sick form this wasn't school you know this was like it felt bigger you know it's like we're older people and um and i was surprised so surprised how we got this massive support from the from the music department from the art department yeah yeah carry on don't don't worry about it. do it have, have fun sort of thing we were like oh my god you know so yeah within a week or two my memory i might be i might be slightly wrong about this but it was in my memory is within a week or two we were doing this kind of lunchtime gig with bruce and we turned up and bruce had a little tiny i mean i remember he had this little tiny amp forget what it was doesn't matter um and he just ripped into you really got me by van in the van ellen's version you know doing the, the, all the eddie stuff and he, he played the guitar like Eddie Van Halen as far as I was concerned and it absolutely leveled me I just had never heard anyone in real terms playing guitar like that in front of me I mean I, you know I thought I was a guitar player but I really wasn't when I heard Bruce play and you know even Wayne the guy that played guitar in the band at the time in Zeus he was a great guitar player but he wasn't like Bruce you know Bruce was like this extraordinary creature that could peel off these licks and he played the solo almost note for note from you know from <laughs> you really got me and I like I just like simultaneously shrank to about that big because I thought oh god I'm useless but then also this whole world of possibility expanded before me you know and, and, and rather amazingly we are literally about to pass sick form college where this happened oh, sorry about that <laughs> I'm getting so excited I'm literally crossing to another car but no we are literally about to pass sick form so um we'll just uh let's let this truck go by there we go so yeah this is Stepney Road um this was the this was my route well, when I first started going to sick form, I lived in Hummelby, so I used to come on the bus, but um, or on the train. But here we are, just to my right over here, Box Hill. You see where it says Box Hill there? That is Scarborough sick form there. And so there was a there was a cat. There was like a porter cabin just literally to the right of that major that main building there. Um, yeah. So this whole area here, as we said, this was we used to walk up this street here. This we used to walk up the railway station all the way up here. And sick forms over the back over there. Yeah. So this is like very emotional for me whenever I come down here really you know yeah. it's really interesting to hear about <clears throat> you had a lot of access points very early on a lot of support that you mentioned and and having that community of musicians mm. um must have been extraordinary because I I can remember it was very hard to come by for musicians where I live for some reason yeah um, but it sounds like you, you, you found the crowd yeah and and to, to, you talk about fate actually <laughs> the, the fact is you know Meeting Bruce and then Jim and yeah, having that friendship with Mark Plunkett, all it's just led to all the stuff that you went on to do. I know. I mean, and, and like it all happened very, very naturally. I mean, there was mm. no forcing of anything. It was. I mean, Scarborough was, and it isn't anymore, sadly, but was back then in sort of the nineteen sort of mid nineteen eighties a very vibrant very important musical center i mean we'd had a venue here called the penthouse which was world famous i mean enormous bands played at the penthouse including the sex pistols and every band you can think of from the 70s you know i think zeppelin even played here white snake played here you know it was one of those bands uh, sorry one of those venues that became synonymous um with the scene and then as a reflection of that promoted the town and so we were kind of came at the tail end of that the, the penthouse had closed down when we were doing gigs but it was replaced by the taboo club which was another great venue which became quite famous um and um the elven home venue and also for us it was the Stephen joseph theater in the round on sunday nights um and and it was there was this huge army of musicians locally that were associated with that 70s period uh, vinegar joe um all the guys that were in vinegar joe they still lived in town and of course that was to do with um well actually it was the mandrakes sorry i got that wrong it was the mandrakes they were a scarborough band that had um um robert palmer in them because robert palmer literally this is Folsgrave. robert palmer lived in one of these houses i think along this rank here and um was was a you know was a very obviously very successful very influential musician and his band the mandrakes were from scarborough and i think some of the members were from bridlington so really important the jags were from here um which was a, a, another important sort of pop band from the 70s so there's a lot going on you know a lot of people used to hang out here lots of people used to play here and so the 80s were uh, an extension of that you know um and we grew up around that. We grew up around this ease of getting a gig. 
I mean, there wasn't a lot of gigs outside of Scarborough, but Scarborough had an extraordinarily sort of more than its fair share in lots of ways of gigs. You know what I mean? Um, so that was kind of random. when I think about it now, I, I realise how lucky we were. But I, you know, I could wander into Scarborough on a Saturday morning and meet up with my friends, and we'd go to Studio One Records, which is just down here. Um, listen, you know, listen to music. We'd go to Bernardine's, I and mean, we had a really great music shop in, in a little tiny town like this. A really great music shop, full of great instruments, people that were interested in, in, in you know, in rock and roll. So we were we were kind of spoiled, really. You know, I think. Got a lot to thank Scarborough for, really. You know, being born around, well, not born around here, you were born in Lincoln? I was born in Lincoln, Lincoln. yeah. But Move, to yeah. move here <clears throat> and to have all these experiences, yeah. incredible. Really. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, and I feel very thankful for that. And, um, you, know, Scar you know, Scarborough's got its issues, of course, every place has, but when I think about the time, when I think about what we experienced, in that time, we were incredibly lucky. And it only was, I've often spoken to a lot of other musicians from, from Scarborough, and they all say the same thing. It was a golden moment in the, in, in, the, in the town's history. You know, it really was, and it was, yeah. And it, it was like a perfect storm. It all happened all at once, and you know, and of course, so many changes were happening in the music industry. You know, everyone was changing over to CD. You know, TV was expanding, channel, you know, and you don't put, I don't think you can put enough emphasis on the fact that Channel 4 changed everything in the UK in terms of the music music on television because Channel 4 got involved with Little Angels. I mean, we formed we formed Little Angels and within about a year or so, we were doing that famous 15 minutes programme, you know, which was Channel 4, which they filmed in Scarborough at the Stephen Joseph Theatres, you know, so <clears throat> it was really, um, really quite extraordinary. It really was.